Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to chapter 35, Animal Behavior. Uh, it's one of my favorite chapters, so get ready. This is going to be a long chapter. Uh, when I did my thesis um, many moons ago, uh, I particularly or specifically studied behavioral ecology. We've talked about ecology before. Ecology is how uh, animals interact with their environment, uh, how all, excuse me, how organisms interact within their environment. Behavioral ecology specifically is how animals interact with their environment. Um, it also studies how their actions affect their fitness. And we've talked about this idea of fitness before. Fitness is the animal's, uh, I don't want to say ability to reproduce, but it's, it's how successful it's been at reproducing. Um, fitness is uh, how likely is it to leave genes behind in the next generation. The, the higher your fitness, the more genes you've left behind in the next generation. The lower your fitness, the, the, the fewer genes you left behind. Uh, important to note, you could have all of these wonderful adaptations that allow you to do amazing things, but if you don't have any kids, you have very low fitness because you have not left behind those genes. It is important you need to leave behind those genes. With this idea of fitness, we need to talk about uh, inclusive fitness. Um, inclusive fitness is the success of passing on those genes and having um, their offspring um, produce surviving offspring. So you're successful if you have um, passed genes on to the next generation. You are actually most successful when your children have had children because at that point you're done. You've succeeded. You did everything you had to do. You had kids, you raised those kids to adulthood, those kids had kids. I'm not sure if you can hear the, um, uh, the neighbors. Uh, let me grab the neighbors really quick and I'll show you what you might be hearing for the rest of the lecture. Uh, you might be hearing now. Here are the babies again. Some of you probably saw the babies already. This is Jean and Mayonnaise. Here are Bitsy and um, Esther. That's right, Esther. Bit Bitsy and Esther and Jean and Mayonnaise. And here's the babies. So you might hear some scratching. I'm going to show you their mother, their adopted mother. Would you quit crawling up me? Oh, baby! <laughs> This is their adop adopted mother. Her name is Little Mama. So you might be hearing her. Say goodbye, Little Mama. She's waving. Yeah, I know. All right, I was going to save the babies for after, but they were being noisy, so I want to make sure you saw the babies. All right, inclusive fitness. We have some chickens that have raised their fitness. Uh, behavioral ecology uh, studies why animals behave the way they do. Uh, it just studies what drives them to act. Uh, what, uh, what is it that pushes them? Why do they do those actions? Um, we could sit and I could film uh, that mother hen um, for a whole afternoon. We would see a dozen different behaviors that she does to defend her chicks, to feed her chicks, to care for her chicks. Um, she has a special call that when she makes it, the babies run to her so that she can feed them. Why does that, why is that successful? Why does that increase her fitness? Because now her babies are eating. Behavioral ecology. Watch an animal when you notice them do a very specific motion, a very specific action. You have to ask, how does it help? How does it help? You may have heard the little cluck, 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 cluck she just made. That's the come eat noise. We need to talk about a few concepts before we go on. Um, first is reproductive success. Reproductive success means you've had uh, children make it to adulthood. Um, I am reproductively successful. I have raised one child to adulthood, have two more on the way. They have not yet quite made it to adulthood, but I, I, I have high hopes. Um, so you have been a reproductive success if your offspring have survived to adulthood. Um, that means you have good or high fitness, relative fitness. 
Adaptive behavior is something that will increase uh, gene frequency in a population. Example is nest guarding. Let's talk about nest guarding. Let's talk about two different uh, animals, two different birds. Let's imagine one bird builds a nest and lays her eggs in the nest and then just leaves. What's going to happen if a raccoon or a coyote or something or a snake comes upon that nest out in the middle of nowhere with no one over the nest? What happens is that predator gets a meal. It's going to eat the eggs and that mother just wasted all of the energy that she put into making those eggs. Nest guarding is a behavior. She chooses to sit on that nest. What happens now? Mama lays her eggs and now she sits on those eggs. What benefit does she gain by sitting on the eggs? Well, now if a raccoon or a snake shows up, they've got to fight mom. And she might very well be able to fight them off. If a coyote shows up, she can do the broken wing behavior, a second behavior, where she flips away and she acts like her wing is broken. And so now the coyote forgets those eggs and wants to eat big fat mama because she's going to be a much better meal than those eggs will. Right? She leads the uh, predator away from the nest, and the predator forgets where the eggs are, and then she flies back. Adaptive behavior. How does that behavior increase an animal's fitness? How does it increase her reproductive success? Nest guarding. Nest guarding increases her reproductive success. You also have to stop and think for a moment, is there a cost? Is there a cost that's applied to this behavior or that comes along with this behavior? That mother who laid her eggs and then just took off, what can she immediately start doing? She can start eating again. She can start recouping that energy that she lost making those eggs. What about mama that sits on the nest? Can she just go out and feed? No, she has to stay on the nest. So is she losing something by this behavior? Does it cost her something? Yeah, it actually does cost her something. It costs her some energy. However, since almost every bird that there is, and as far as I know, there's not a bird that doesn't, every bird will guard their nest. Because they guard their nest, it must be that the economics work. It must be that the energy investment that she puts into losing energy by sitting on that nest is paid back with surviving offspring. A social behavior. This is lots of fun. Social behaviors, these are interdependent interactions within a species. Um, sociobiology. Sociobiology was uh, a term that was coined by um, uh, E.O. Wilson, Edward Wilson. Um, very, very famous in biology circles. Very famous uh, researcher. He coined the term sociobiology by studying ants. Um, spend an afternoon and do a Wikipedia search for E.O. Wilson. Kind of neat story. Um, Social behavior, inter interdependent interactions within a species. Um, so because we've all been locked in our houses for the last month, uh, this is actually a really, really good example. How has your daily routine changed? If we were taking this class in person, if we were showing up uh, and being in the classroom with one another, how have you, what have you done differently or what would you have done differently to come listen to me give you this lecture in person versus listening to this lecture on YouTube? If you wanted to be sitting on the toilet with your pants around your ankles, you could be listening to this lecture. If we're going to be doing that in class, you obviously cannot do that. Your behaviors have changed because you don't have to be around as many people anymore. Do you probably go longer than you used to before bathing? Do you probably go longer than you used to before brushing your hair? Do you, do you probably go longer than you used to before you touch a razor? All of you probably answered yes. You've probably gone longer than you normally do between showers. You've probably gone longer than you usually do brushing your hair. You've probably gone longer than you usually do shaving. Why? Because you're not going to be around other people. If you're not going to be around other people, you don't need to do these behaviors. Sociobiology, um, claiming a territory, um, there's so many, so many behaviors. 90% of the behaviors that we do as humans are only because we have to come in contact with other humans. Um, 
a really good example of uh, social behaviors would be uh, a communal rookery. And let's have a look at this communal rookery. So I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but in this picture, and again, I hope you've got this downloaded and can look at it on your uh, screen at home. Let me see if I can make it bigger. No, oh, rats, I can't. Okay, so what we see in this picture is we've got the ocean back here and we have a rocky beach and all these little dots that we see are penguins. Penguins are ground nesters. As we look at this rocky beach, we see there's some sandy areas up here. We have some areas in the sun. We have some areas in the shade. If we look at this area, do you imagine that there are probably good nesting sites and bad nesting sites in this area? Do you want a rocky bottom? Do you want a sandy bottom? Do you want a sunny area? Do you want a shady area? All of those things play into what makes a good nesting site and a bad nesting site. If we have different qualities of nesting sites, that probably gives you advantages or disadvantages to raising your young. And obviously you want the best nesting site so that you have the best chance of your child surviving and therefore increasing your fitness. If that's the case then, what happens if two penguins show up to the same nesting site? There's going to be a fight. They're going to fight each other to, to decide who gets to keep that nesting site. Only because it is a social area. Only because multiple individuals of the same species come in contact with one another do we have to engage in these social behaviors, social biology. It's more than just behavioral ecology. It's how do they interact with one another. 